Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And this means that I have the most wonderful job ever. I get to help you connect with your angels and the wisdom of your soul and inspiration and love And my offerings include angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. To learn more, you can mosey on over to my website, illuminatingsouls.com. And I also invite you to sign up for my mailing list, and then you will receive all the announcements from me about what I have coming up soon and also some inspirational morsels every now and then. You can also visit me at my Illuminating Souls Facebook page. So lots of ways we can connect. But for now, I am here to help you come into a calming, loving, soothing sanctuary where you can rest and replenish and perhaps even drift off to sleep. This podcast is inspired by two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and listening to a sleep podcast. Every night for the last few years, I have listened to a sleep podcast to help me drift off. It helps build a bridge between my waking consciousness and that dreamy, drifty expanse of consciousness that invites me into sleep. One of the podcasts I am listening to now, well, first off, I listen to this one. (laughs) So this one absolutely helps put me to sleep. So first, let me share with you what I'm listening to, but then I want to share with you more about this podcast and what you can expect and how you can use it. So at the moment, I am re-listening to the podcast, The Sleepy Bookshelf, and Elizabeth Grace's reading of Pride and Prejudice. She does such a lovely job and the episodes are well produced and I cannot even make it through 20 minutes of an episode before I am gone. And I already know what the story is and so I love just dipping in and out to see what the characters are doing and where we are in the story. So that's what I listened to last night. But for this podcast... There are two components. This is the first one. This is where we go into the introductions and I share the angels with you and I bring forward beautiful angelic love with you. And this part usually lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we go into story time. And story time can include a story from my life, I might read to you something that's in the public domain. We might flip through the pages of an old TV guide or an old recipe book. And that part usually lasts about 40 minutes, so each episode runs an hour. And that's because that is my preference for a sleep podcast. There are some sleep podcasts out there that run about 20 minutes, and I find that I feel pressure (laughs) to hurry up and fall asleep. And then if the 20 minutes passes and I get to the end of the episode and I'm awake, 
that just exacerbates my awareness of my wakefulness in that moment. Whereas I rarely ever make it to the end of a 60 minute podcast and still be awake. So these episodes are an hour long. And what's so sweet is over the 150 plus episodes that I've been making this podcast, for those of you who are regular listeners, you have shared with me how you use the podcast. Some of you listen in your waking hours and I get to keep you company as you do your work or go for a walk or just go about your day. Others of you shared with me that your favorite part of these episodes is the first 20 minutes when the angels are here. And I will share with you that when I listen to these episodes, I fast forward to the story time. And maybe that's because I, I'm with the angels all the time and I want to get to a story. I, I like a story to help put me to sleep rather than coming into some sort of meditative or contemplative state, which is what we do in the first 15 to 20 minutes. So there's a little bit of everything here for you, and you don't have to listen to the whole episode if you don't want to. You can listen to the first part or just skip over to the story time. You can listen in the daytime or you can listen in the evening. This is here for you to utilize in whatever way best serves you. And also, I have started posting these episodes onto YouTube. There is not a video of me, so don't get excited. (laughs) There's not a video of me recording these, but they do have an audiogram. So there's those little um, animated bars that just share that I am speaking But YouTube is an option for you, as well as your favorite podcast apps. And I also invite you to leave a review on iTunes or Spotify. I'm really seeking to up-level my subscription levels for the podcast and the reviews. And so I just thought I'd put it out there and ask you. So as I record this, it is early in the morning. I always love to record first thing in the morning. It is gloomy and gray, but the gloom will burn off and we will have a beautiful sunny day here. This kind of weather we call June gloom, even though it's May. And so it has a very cozy, quiet feeling. And as I record this, it is May 19th. I don't know when you will be listening to this, May 19th, 2023, I should add the year, because you might be listening to this five years from now. And I will say, in present time, the energy has been wonky. It has been sticky. I know we got out of Mercury retrograde earlier this week, but it doesn't feel like that's the case. I know last week I felt a lot of anxiousness. I felt like I wanted to jump out of my skin. And this was not my personal material. This was collective energy. And I just mention it in case you have been feeling it too. As empaths, and if you're listening, in all likelihood, you are an empath, which means you feel deeply we often will feel these waves of collective energy. So what I want to invite you to do is get comfortable in your body. And if you can't get comfortable in your body because you are in pain or something is going on, just breathe love into your body and the angels will help you with this. And just take some nice deep breaths in and out. And I am going to ask the angels to join us. They are already here, but I love to share the ritual of calling them in with you. And just a reminder, you can call them in all the time too. You don't need me for this. 
I love sharing it with you. But any time, day or night, you can call the angels to you and they will be with you. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of love for each of our beloveds receiving this message. Angels, I am so deeply grateful for your presence and your support, your compassion and your encouragement as we continue on our earthly journeys. And angels, I ask that you bring healing light in service to each of our highest and best good. That you clear away anything that is not ours, anything that no longer serves our highest and best good. Assisting us in ascending our energy so that we may be even more present in the greater expanse of all that we are. And dear ones, just take another deep breath in. The angels are inviting you to breathe in the divine golden light that is here for you. This world, this universe is filled with so much love for you. You are being supported as you navigate your path. The angels ask that you give your worries to them and they will transform them into prayers, prayers of love, prayers of support. Life is blossoming open for you. And this concept of blossoming is so deeply beautiful because it speaks of an innate life force and wisdom and pattern when life opens up and we change form and we greet the day, we greet the light as the light greets us and beauty is born and seeds of beauty have been planted in your name Waves of inspiration and creativity and community and friendship have been planted in your name. And even if they have yet to find you, they are on their way to you now. So breathe in the love. And the angels say thank you for receiving the blessings we bring to you now. Your prayers are not too much. Your prayers are not troubling the angels or keeping them from something more important or more urgent. It is important to always remember that God's love is endless. Just like the sun, you cannot use up too much sun. Use up as much as you need. Drink until you are replenished. The angels have such admiration and love for you because they know how challenging earthly incarnation can be. And you are a light in this world. You strive to keep love in your heart. You strive to keep the flame of hope kindled. The angels say thank you. You are one of the ways God's love is made visible in this world. So breathe in and imagine, visualize, allow it to be so that the angels are infusing the space you are in with a beautiful soft pink light. 
that has been calibrated just for you. That the angels know what is going on in your life, in your heart, and in your consciousness. And this pink light is infused with love and healing, resourcefulness and inspiration. So just soak it in and this light can expand to fill your home. It can travel to those you love. And you need not send it. The angels will send it in your name. Just visualize this beautiful light expanding. As streams of it go traveling around the world, wherever your heart feels it should go. It is one of the most joyful things to send blessings to others. Just in your heart, like you are the fairy godmother or fairy godfather, <laughs> you are sending blessings of light to those you love. And as you do so, the angels bestow a special prayer and blessing where you guide it. And right now I am sending prayers and blessings to you, to you, beautiful, precious soul. I think it is a miracle that we have found our way together in this moment. That here I am in Vallejo, California, sitting at my desk, recording this message. And then technology and the internet and podcast apps will make it so that you can find this message in the right and perfect time. And however you found me in this podcast or how I found you, what a miracle that is. And in this moment, I get to send you a blessing of love. I get to thank God for the gift of you. I get to be in gratitude that our paths crossed however they did. Whether we personally know each other or we virtually know each other. Or maybe this is the first time we are ever meeting. Here we are, two people who long to leave this world a better place. Isn't that lovely to recognize in this moment? And there are many others. And so this ripple of love moves into the world. This ripple of love finds each and every person listening to this message whenever they are listening across time and space. So just breathe in and allow the love to find you. And if you have any prayers or intentions that you wish to share with the angels, I invite you to do so. How can they help you? How can they support you? Let them know. I have just a very sweet prayer for myself. It's short and it says, help make this easy. <laughs> this seems to be my prayer quite often. Whatever it is, whatever the it is, Help make it easy. Help make editing this podcast easy. Help make my day easy. Help make my creative endeavors easy. I am best friends with ease right now. <laughs> so that's my short and sweet prayer. Feel free to borrow it. Help make it easy. 
Isn't that a lovely intention? I don't know why that makes me happy, (laughs) but it does. And I'm happy to share it with you. So you go ahead and curl on up if your plan is to sleep and pull the blankets up just so, fluffing your pillows, snuggling on in. And you drift off whenever you are ready. And in the meanwhile, we are going to move on into story time. And I am going to read to you for a while. So if you have been a long-time listener, you will likely have recognized that I have a fascination for California history, especially Los Angeles, because I lived there for many, many years. And I'm fascinated by the newness of much of the development of Los Angeles. And so I found this article It is published in the California Outlook, a progressive weekly. It was published in February of 1914. And it's all about the development of the La Brea Tar Pits. Now, for as many years as I lived in Los Angeles, I actually never visited the La Brea Tar Pits. It never really called to me but I drove past it a million times. And if you don't know what the La Brea Tar Pits are, it is an archeological excavation where they have found dinosaur bones and fossils. And it's, it's fascinating. And it's in the middle of Los Angeles in the Miracle Mile area. And This is about the early years when it was being developed. And I found it to be a fascinating article, and perhaps you will too. So the headline says, Marvelous Discoveries at La Brea Rancho. That's what it was called at the time. What the scientists are bringing to light out of the ancient animal traps. And the ancient animal traps they are referring to is the thick tar that had been created that would trap the animals. So they're not talking about hunter-gatherers trapping animals, but rather the environmental conditions that created this wealth of archaeological material. So we start off in this way. Close beside a paved boulevard, eight miles from the center of the city of Los Angeles, under the direction of men of science, a gang of laborers is busy digging from the earth the secrets of ages so long past that in contemplating them, the ordinary individual is apt to wonder whether or not, in such remote times, the earth could have had form and been the scene of animal existence. Now, just to interject and put some context to this, in 1914, this area of Los Angeles had yet to be developed. These days, it is urbanized. Where La Brea Tar Pits is, you've got the Wilshire Corridor, You've got buildings all around it. You've got the museums around it. So when they say that it's eight miles from Los Angeles Center, they were referring to downtown LA. But now everything around the La Brea Tar Pits is built up. So now it would be written smack dab in the middle of LA is the La Brea Tar Pits. So I'll continue. The work to which reference is made is being done on the Rancho La Brea, a tract of land embracing in all some 2,000 acres belonging to the Ross estate, an estate valued at many millions of dollars to which the only heir is G. Allen Hancock of Los Angeles. This is the part that I found fascinating. So if you're familiar with L.A., the name Hancock 
may be familiar to you because of Hancock Park. So this whole tract of land that we now know as Miracle Mile, Hancock Park, Mid Wilshire, all of that was part of this estate that one person owned, which is astounding. A few episodes back, we heard about Colonel Griffith and how he bequeathed his property to become Griffith Park. Well, G. Allen Hancock had inherited from his mother this huge swath of land that became much of the urban part of Los Angeles. The actual operations of the scientific party of exploration are taking place on a very small section of this great property. Two or three city blocks would comprehend it all. Here, close under the surface, are found vast deposits of bones of mammals and birds encased in the sinks of asphaltic tar. The mammals and birds to which these bones belonged, according to the calculations of geologists, lived in the Pleistocene. I should really know how to say that because I've watched a lot of Jurassic Park. So if I'm not saying that properly, please forgive me. Um, Lived in the Pleistocene age, an era which succeeded in the glacial period. They lived, it is believed, 200,000 years ago, yet so perfectly preserved are the bones that entire skeletons of animals which have been extinct for ages, some of which heretofore have not even been known to science, can be collected and put together. Within the brief space of half a year, the county of Los Angeles has recovered from these pits on the La Brea Rancho more bones of prehistoric mammals and birds many times over than have previously existed in all the museums of the world. Heretofore, scientists have spent large sums of money and devoted years of labor to securing mere fragments of the bone structure of the ancient Denzians of the animal world. Expeditions have been fitted out by rich universities and sent to the furthermost corners of the world in quest of fewer bones than are now taken each day from the deposits at the Rancho La Brea. Within a short time, there will be a sufficient supply of bones in the possession of the county to stock all leading museums with skeletons of such animals, for instance, as a saber-toothed tiger, a complete skeleton of which has not heretofore been found anywhere. This writer really loves the word heretofore. (laughs) Let's see how many more times this word shows up in this article. Long ago, in the dawn of time, the earthquakes, which evidently took place with great frequency on this coast, jammed and broke the earth strata at many points. In the particular region of the La Brea Ranch, or rather the northern point of it, were great quantities of oil, which were not tapped until a few years ago. The gases from the oil deposits followed the lines of least resistance issued at various points through the broken strata. Wherever this happened, a sort of liquid asphalt or tar, somewhat heavier than crude oil, lined the vents. Numerous pockets were formed. In many places, asphaltic pools were formed on the surface of the earth. There are several lines of conjecture as to the manner in which these pools became animal traps, but it is reasonable to suppose, for instance, that the waters rushing down from the mountains in the winter seasons formed small lakes over them. Large animals probably waded into these lakes to drink. The sticky tar underlying the water entrapped them. Their struggles attracted other animals seeking prey, The bones now found tell the story of thousands of primordial tragedies, which doubtless were accompanied by titanic struggles. Great quantities of bones of carrion beasts and birds testify likewise to the work of these scavengers. Away back in Civil War times, 
the late Major Hancock secured possession of the great Rancho La Brea. He and his wife, the late Mrs. Ida Hancock Ross, lived there for many years. After the death of Major Hancock, the widow passed through a long, hard struggle to earn a living and hold the property intact. Barley was raised in the land, and some stock was also raised. Fifteen or twenty years ago, however, the oil prospectors who had begun their work in the Buena Vista Street District in Los Angeles, and who kept moving west, found the oil deposits on the La Brea Ranch. The long struggles of Mrs. Hancock ended at that time, and the property, which had previously kept her land poor, made her one of the wealthiest women in California. A picture published herewith will show the old Hancock home on the La Brea property. When Mrs. Hancock, later Mrs. Ross, died in May of last year, that would have been 1913, she was living in a magnificent mansion on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. It is to her son, Mr. G. Allen Hancock, that the people of Los Angeles are indebted for the privilege of mining the deposits herein described. The University of California had secured permission to work on the premises and did some exploration there in March of 1913. Prior to that time, the Southern California Academy of Sciences and the Los Angeles high schools had done some excavating. The Academy material was turned over to the Los Angeles County Museum, where it is on display at the present time. Through Polytechnic Institute, hearing of the good work being done is said to have contemplated an attempt to secure control of the La Brea deposits, and Andrew Carnegie, who wanted to secure the best of the specimens for the Smithsonian Institute, made Mr. Hancock a liberal offer. This offer, however, was rejected. In the meantime, the supervisors of Los Angeles County had become interested due to the activities of a number of scientific people who urged that the county should undertake a complete exploration of the field and secure possession of these invaluable relics for the ownership of the people. The supervisors placed the matter in the hands of Mr. S. F. Daggett, curator of the County Museum at Exposition Park, and directed him to take all steps necessary in the matter. Mr. Daggett undertook with gratifying success a series of negotiations with Mr. Hancock, who evidenced his public spirit by giving the county complete control for a period of two years from July 1, 1913. Under Mr. Daggett's direction, work was commenced at once, and it has been taking place without intermission to the present time. It will go on unless halted by the supervisors, as long as the time limitation of the contract will permit and from the disposition Mr. Hancock has heretofore, there's the word again, displayed, it is hoped that other concessions, if required for the completion of the work, can be secured on the most favorable terms. At this time, 26 persons are employed in the work, 14 in excavating and cleaning the bones, and 12 in sorting, classifying, and preparing them at the museum. Some idea of the proportions of the work may be secured from the following figures with respect to the bones and skeletons that have been excavated, cleaned, and delivered to the museum in splendid shape during the past month. The formidable list of scientific recoveries include 165 saber-toothed tiger skulls. That's amazing. 165 saber-toothed tiger skulls. It should be remembered that there was not a complete skull heretofore in the possession of any museum. 100 wolf skulls, 8 skulls of giant ground sloths, and 11 boxes of bones of the same animal. 4 lion skulls and 10 boxes of lion bones, 7 horse skulls and 1 box of horse bones, 
14 skulls of bison and 18 boxes of bison bones, 5 skulls of camels and 17 boxes of camel bones, 1 mastodon skull, 2 skulls of teratornis, a bird new to science, and, and there's lots of bones. I'm just going to go through some of the species they found in a special and a species of small sloth new to science. The type is now deposited at the museum. New types are being found almost daily, and Curator Daggett has had the privilege of classifying and naming more beasts and birds new to science, perhaps, than any scientist of his time. Since the work commenced, 60 species of birds, some not known before, have been classified, and in many instances skeletons have been fully prepared and set up. As an example of the richness of the deposits from a scientific standpoint, it may be mentioned that Dr. Miller of the State Normal School at Los Angeles, who is regarded as one of the foremost experts in the classification of birds in a single afternoon, while looking through three or four small parcels of bones, found three new species, which heretofore the scientists had never found. There are scores of boxes of bones of birds and small mammals which have not yet been examined, and it is expected that when this work is undertaken, many more new species will be added to the list already compiled. The Teratornis, to which reference has already been made, was perhaps one of the largest birds that ever existed. The bones show that it was about three times the size of a condor, and that it had a 14-foot sweep of wings. This find, in itself, will be a tremendous interest to scientists all over the world. Peacocks, much like the Indian peacocks of the present day, were trapped in the animal pit, and sufficient bones have been discovered to provide several complete skeletons. The golden eagle and many smaller eagles, together with various species of hawks and birds of the vulture type, have been found abundant. Of small birds, nearly every species is represented from the sparrow size up. The scientists at the museum have been able to pick out, for instance, such birds as the woodpecker and the linnet. A recent new find comprises the bones of a bird resembling the secretary bird of Africa. It is a new type. The body and head evidently resemble those of the eagle, while the legs were long like those of a stork. Among the mammals, perhaps the most interesting discoveries of bones are those of the, quote, imperial elephant. This huge beast was very much like the mammoth, found in Siberia, but larger, being by all odds the giant of the elephant species. It had tusks six to eight inches in diameter and 16 feet long, it stood 15 to 16 feet high. The ordinary elephant is from 9 to 11 feet. And it is doubtful if there is an elephant in captivity that stands more than, than 11 and a half feet high. One complete skull of an imperial elephant has been taken out, and three others are soon to be removed. In a single pit, these three great skulls, partly uncovered, can be seen at the present time while near them is the partly exposed skull of a mastodon. The interest and value attaching to this find will be better understood when it is stated that heretofore, <laughs> one more time with that word, the only portion of the bone frame of this animal in any museum consisted of one tusk and a part of the skull in a museum in the city of Mexico and some fragments of bones found in Ohio. The Los Angeles Museum will have a complete skeleton for mounting. It has one tusk eight inches in diameter and 18 feet long. Two or three complete skeletons of saber-toothed tigers have been set up in the museum. A glance at these skeletons will show that these tigers were of great size, and they must have been formidable and ferocious beasts. The finding of tiger bones is so vast that this animal can be shown 
in every size from the kitten to complete maturity. Many other species of cats have also had representation in the collection. The giant ground sloth was a large and clumsy beast. The skeleton in the museum is shown in the picture published herewith will serve to give some idea as to its enormous bulk. It seems to have been largely an herbivore. A small sloth new to science has also been found. A number of camels has been recovered, both male and female, young and adult, and a great number of bison, horses, etc. There is one lion of the African type, the skull of which is 18 inches long. Several smaller lions are also shown in the collection, as well as lions of the mountain type. There are five species of wolves, one of them, the Canis durus, being the largest known, two species of coyotes, foxes, small cats, deer, antelope, badgers, weasels, skunks, and many other beasts and beasties. There's a huge bear, which must have been nearly the size of a hippopotamus. It was probably of the cave bear order. Beside it, a grizzly would appear small. There are also black bear and other species. Another interesting find in one of the pits was a cypress tree of a species not found in the southern part of California. Nevertheless, from the position of this tree when found... It is evident it was growing on the spot and was overwhelmed and killed by the tar. Bones of animals were packed all around it, among the branches and above it. The wood in the cypress tree still has the qualities of life. Only the upper part, which was sufficiently close to the surface to have been reached, perhaps by some sea pages of water, had rotted and been eaten by worms. The rest of the trunk, which is of good size, was sound throughout and could be used today in the manufacture of furniture. When one stops to think that this tree has probably been buried some 200,000 years ago, he realizes that there are reasons for the tremendous enthusiasm scientists are showing at the present time. Curator Daggett is of the belief that scientists will be making pilgrimages to Los Angeles from all parts of the world for the next 50 years. A great many insects of hard shell varieties have been found. The deposits are found in four of the 10 exploration pits which have been opened. They are encountered from three to five feet under the surface and have been taken out to a depth of 18 feet. Test pits which have been sunk further show that they do not extend far beyond the 18-foot level. And then the article ends abruptly there. All right, and then I printed out an autobiography about G. Allen Hancock because I was kind of fascinated by this whole thing. And you know what? I forgot to print out where I got it from. It says Press Reference Library, And it must have been published before 1927 because I got it off of Google Books and it's in the public domain. I know that much, but let me read it to you. It says, Hancock, George Allen, Petroleum Interests, Los Angeles, California, was born at San Francisco, California, July 26th, 1875, the son of Major Henry and Ida Hancock. His maternal grandfather was Count, oh, here we go. I'm going to try and say these words right. His maternal grandfather was Count Gostin Herazathi, the pioneer wine manufacturer of Northern California. His father and mother both came to California in 1849, the latter coming when a child with her parents who crossed the plains from Wisconsin in a prairie schooner. Henry Hancock was a major in the United States Army during the Mexican War. He latter took up the study of engineering and law. One of his early tasks as an engineer was the laying out of the city of Los Angeles. 
He also published the first map of that city. He was an ardent believer in the city's future and purchased much land in the vicinity among the tracts he acquired being the famous Rancho La Brea, covering 2,000 acres, which is still intact and now owned by Mr. Hancock. I just, that just leaves me breathless. <laughs> like, that's an amazing tract of land, and that it was all intact and undeveloped. Mr. Hancock married Miss Genevieve Dean Mullen at Los Angeles, California, November 27th, 1901, the issue of the marriage being Bertram and Rosemary Hancock. He received his early education in the primary schools and at Brewer's Military Academy in San Mateo, California, which he attended during 1980, I'm sorry, during 1888 and 1889. In 1890, he enrolled as a student in the Belmont School at Belmont, California. Here he remained during the years of 1891, 92, and 93. His vacations between school terms were spent on La Brea Ranch. He shared with the men of the labors of the field, learning to raise hay and grain, and performing his full part of the plowing, mowing, stacking, and baling of hay. He helped to care for the livestock and assisted at chores. By the time he had completed his school courses, he was an adept agriculturalist. His first occupation after he took up the responsibilities of active work was in the same field. He continued in the management and operation of La Brea Ranch until he was 25 years of age. It was at this period that the early discoveries of petroleum were being made in California. The industry was rapidly developing and becoming one of the most important in the state. La Brea Ranch was one of the localities in which petroleum was found. A firm believer in the future of the new industry, Mr. Hancock abandoned his agricultural pursuits and turned his attention to petroleum production. From the outset, he determined to make a thorough study of every phase of the subject. He first gave systematic attention to the subject of oil well machinery, making himself familiar with the most modern devices employed in the work. He then went into the fields, performing every task connected with the drilling of the wells and the extraction of the oil. He gave much time and attention to perfecting the details of his work. Fully three years were spent in these self-imposed tasks, after which he urged his mother, his father having died in 1884, to allow him enough capital to sink a well on a portion of the property that had not already been leased to oil operators. He began work at once and from the outset was uniformly successful, meeting obstacle after obstacle and overcoming them, where other operators, under similar conditions but with much less fixity, fixity, F-I-X-I-T-Y, of purpose abandoned their projects. In due time, he returned to his mother $90,000, which he had advanced before Mr. Hancock was able to secure any returns from the investment he had made in the first well. For the past seven years, he has continued the development work on La Brea Ranch. At the present time, there are 65 producing wells on the property all of them drilled and brought in under the management of Mr. Hancock. This number is exclusive of the wells drilled on the property by the Salt Lake Oil Company, to whom a portion of the property had been leased in 1900. The wells under Mr. Hancock's management are handled with the most modern machinery, the engines pumping the 65 wells being the first engines on any oil fields that were run successfully by compressed air. They run at a pressure of 40 pounds. This pumping scheme required about a year of experimenting before it became successful. 
The idea had been tried a number of times in other fields, but up to this time had never been successful. Many engineers of undoubted authority have examined the plant and declared it absolutely successful. In the midst of his large business responsibilities, Mr. Hancock has found time to devote himself to the study of music and is recognized in Los Angeles musical circles as an accomplished and talented musician. He has always been an ardent supporter of musical culture and has given of his time and money to furthering the interests of music in that city. He is a gifted cellist, playing that instrument in the Los Angeles Symphony Orchestra for the pleasure he derives from the work. He is the owner of one of, if not the greatest, violoncellos, I guess that would be a cello, in existence, it being a Nicholas Gagliano made in the year of 1747. Mr. Hancock is the owner of Rancho La Brea Oil Company, vice president of the Los Angeles Hibernian Bank, Hibernian H-I-B-E-R-N-I-A-N, Hibernian Bank, treasurer of the Los Angeles Symphony Association, and for two and a half years prior to 1910, he was president of the Automobile Association of Southern California. He is a member of the California Club, Los Angeles Athletic Club, and the Gamut Club of Los Angeles, and the South Coast Yacht Club. Well, there you go. How is that for an adventure? And, you know, I guess one of the reflections I can share as they're talking about oil production, it is a weird thing, but throughout Los Angeles, you have an urban area and the middle of that, there is an oil well. Actually, where I lived, I used to live near Pico and Doheny, for those of you who know Los Angeles. And literally a quarter of a block away, was an oil well. And you couldn't really see it because there were walls around it, but you could feel the vibration of it when it was running. And this was half a block away from Beverly Hills. So a very urbanized area and in the middle of it, an oil well. I don't know. Very interesting. And again, I'm just fascinated by this because of the profound development that happened in a relatively short period of time. So that 2,000 acres around what we know as Miracle Mile and Hancock Park and Mid Wilshire was undeveloped and was being used to farm hay until they discovered oil and then it completely got built up is fascinating to me because if we're looking at timeline, 1914 isn't that long ago, especially when you look at the history of Europe, right? So I just always find this fascinating and it's also kind of sleepy and snoozeworthy, right? So maybe you're asleep by now. (laughs) And if not, There are over 150 more episodes, so you can queue up another one, and I will be happy to keep you company for hours longer. In the meanwhile, though, I am so grateful for the gift of you. Thank you for allowing me the honor and blessing of spending this time with you. It would be fascinating to go back and compare notes with what they assumed they knew about the La Brea Tar Pits in 1914 and what they know now. But I'm not going to do that in this episode. So my friends, thank you so much for allowing me the honor of spending time with you. I love you. I wish you the sweetest of dreams. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you.